Now, Antioch, I'm tired of talking about negative things. It's time to talk about something positive. Antioch is first mentioned in the same verse when they first mention the choosing of deacons. This is positive. Now, in Acts chapter 11, many of the disciples went to Antioch, and they spake unto the Grecians there, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. This is a positive mention of Antioch. And that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Well, that's positive as well. This group of Christians in Antioch would soon be the ones sending care packages and relief back down into Judea, where they really needed some help. And they sent these care packages by hand from Barnabas and Saul. And Barnabas and Saul, that's pretty good delivery men too. These are all positive mentions. Now, Peter, as pictured on the right here, Peter was starting off good, but then he started, he started to kind of just slip into a bad doctrine. And Paul had to confront him to his face. And this confrontation happened in Antioch. Peter got straightened out in Antioch. And now, you might say that Antioch is in Syria. So how come I'm not mentioning the first time Syria appears in the Bible? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm avoiding that, because it might be negative. And so you're probably going to look in your little search engines and you're going to try to find the first time the word Syria appears in the Bible. And sure enough, you'll find it in Judges chapter 10. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtoreth, which is a form of Easter, and the gods of Syria. Now I admit... That's pretty bad. And that right there is probably going to just totally trounce everything I got done saying. Search engines are pretty good. I think they're a useful tool and I use them myself. I think sometimes though we rely on them too much. Sometimes people convince themselves that they are theologians because they can have their computer search for things while they're out mowing the lawn or something. And when they come back in, it's already printed out a nice little report for them, and off they go. But I still like the old-fashioned way, the true scholarship. And if you dig and dig and dig, you might just find an even earlier mention Genesis 25, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian. Now you see that letter N on the end? That probably didn't show up in a search engine. The daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. Now this is a wife to Isaac. It's almost as if God is saying, here's a good place to find a wife. And you remember earlier, Solomon, he was finding a wife in Egypt. Now, Isaac is a picture of Christ because, you know, there's, symbol, there's symbolism there. He, he was the sacrifice at one point. And if he is a picture of Christ, well, Rebecca is his bride. And if we're Christians, we're a bride of Christ. Maybe there's something to all this. Now, Antioch is the new center. It's away from the Gentile centers of Alexandria, Egypt, Athens, and Rome. And it's away from the Jewish center of Jerusalem. Antioch symbolizes the Christian's new life apart from the heathenism of the Gentiles and ritualism of Judaism. 
Second Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, when a Gentile is saved, he is to leave his heathenistic lifestyle for a new spiritual location in Christ. Likewise, when a Jew is saved, he is to leave his ritualism for a new spiritual location in Christ. In Galatians 3.28, Paul states that there is neither Jew nor Greek, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians 10.32, he divides mankind into three groups, Jews, Gentiles, the Church of God. As God gives born-again man a new spiritual location, he also gives his new church a new physical location. In Acts 11.22, Barnabas moves from Jerusalem to Antioch. He is the man who was responsible for Paul being in the ministry. It was Barnabas who went to Tarsus to get Paul, then named Saul. And in Acts 11.25, this all happens. Upon finding him, Barnabas brought him back to Antioch, not Jerusalem. The primary figure of the New Testament church actually began his ministry in Antioch. Paul had visited Jerusalem in Acts chapter 9 and had even preached there, but his ministry to the Gentiles really began when he departed from Antioch in Acts with Barnabas. Now when some so-called Christian Judaizers came up to Antioch from Jerusalem and began to teach the believers there that, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Well, Paul and Barnabas confronted them. Afterwards, Paul and Barnabas went down and spoke with the apostles concerning this. They formed a council and returned to their beloved Antioch with a written statement to the effect that Judaism had no hold over the New Testament church. It may well be that many of the originals that we have heard so much about from the people that say we desperately need them or we just can't possibly know what God says, it may be that many of them were written right there in Antioch. Now, Egypt is a type of the world. But Antioch is a type of a Christian's new life in Christ. Which one do you think that God would use to preserve his word? God will not do anything contrary to his nature. It would be inconsistent with God. God's nature to use Alexandria Egypt to preserve his word when he paints such a dismal picture of it in scripture and in fact there's no record of any of the New Testament Christians ever visit there Antioch on the other hand was greatly used by God as the center of New Testament Christianity Paul never took up residence in Jerusalem but always returned to Antioch now looking from the spiritual and practical aspect Antioch would obviously be the logical location of the true Bible text. Bring up the subject of translations. The side that I have poked many holes through, they will start arguing about this verse as a last resort. Acts chapter 12, verse 4. And when he, they're speaking of King Herod, had apprehended him, they're speaking of Peter, he put Peter in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now many claim that this is a mistranslation. In fact, all of the new translations that you'll find in certain bookstores, they say the word Passover. Here's the Amplified saying Passover. Here's the New American Standard saying Passover. I could run through every one of the new translations and show you they say Passover, but it would take too long because they all do. So which is it? Should it be Easter or Passover? Now, Tyndale's translation says Easter. And he, he had a really good translation going there. If only he would have been able and allowed to finish it, the Catholics caught him and burned him. Uh, him and his copies that he had made. Later on, Miles Coverdale would, would take over where Tyndale left off. and His version has Easter. The King James Version has Easter. But the newer versions, well, they have Passover. 
the New America Standard, NIV, New Living, the Revised, the Amplified, Good News Bible, Message, English Standard, American Standard, you name it. Now, both of them are translating this one word, Pascha. That's the Greek word. Pascha is used in the Bible 29 times. 28 times in the authorized King James, it gets translated as Passover. Except in Acts 12.4. Now, if I were on the other side, I would use this against my side. And I'm just being honest. That, that doesn't look too good for us. I would definitely harp on this and bring it up and use it. And, of course, they do. Well, let's define the term Easter. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to say anything about bunny rabbits or colored eggs. That's a subject that could go on for days. Easter, though, is basically one of the many pagan festivals that celebrate the moon goddess, queen of heaven worship, that was running rampant. You probably recognize many of those names. As you can see, there's various forms of the the spelling and different dialects. Istra, Ashtoreth, Ishtar, Isis, Ashtart. And Ashtoreth shows up in the Bible a lot. Easter is basically the queen of heaven. This is paganism. Now, I'm going to highlight the word Ashtoreth there to show you how it shows up in the uh, Old Testament. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians. Also, you see Queen of Heaven get mentioned a few times. Jeremiah chapter 44, the Queen of Heaven, Queen of Heaven, Queen of Heaven. And they were worshiping her. And then in Ezekiel, I have the word Tammuz show up. Now, Tammuz, you may not re really recognize you're probably more familiar with the term Horus. This would be the son of Isis. So it's all Queen of Heaven and her son, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Diana makes a, makes a reference in the book of Acts. So, but should the word Easter be translated Pascha? Should Pascha be translated as Easter? Is the word Passover the correct word here? Well, let's look at the context. That always helps. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Wow, that's our detail. That's what we needed to know. Peter is arrested during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, when does that happen? When does that take place? Well, Leviticus chapter 23, in the 14th day of the first month, by the way, their first month is our month of April. Okay, In the 14th day of the first month at even, Okay, it's, well, you know what even means. That's the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Okay, we'll get a calendar here. Here's April. Uh, not necessarily this year. I just grabbed this off the internet. Now, the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Okay, there it is. There's the Passover right there. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's going to last for seven days. Okay, so you got the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21. That seven-day period is the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. So on one of those days... After the Passover is when Peter gets arrested. Now, think about it. The Passover was one day. Did, uh, did the second born children die on, on, you know, day two? Did the angel of death come back 
day three, killing the thirdborn, fourthborn. Let's say you got the Passover and then this whole extra week. No. No, you'd have to be the ninth child to survive that. My goodness. Numbers 28, and in the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. This is making itself very clear. Now, some people go, oh, why does the Bible repeat itself? Maybe sometimes because it knows people are going to start questioning things. So God repeats himself. The 14th day, that's that's the Passover. And in the 15th day of this month is the feast. The seven days shall you have unleavened bread. Well, okay, that's the way I read it too. On the 14th is the Passover, and then you got the feast of unleavened bread. Numbers 33, and they departed from Ramses in the first month. On the 15th day of the first month, which is the morrow after the Passover. If you get to the 15th day, you are now after the Passover. I like it when the Bible is real clear like that. And I like it even better when I can find it in the Bible twice. Joshua chapter 5, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. I just love that. Deuteronomy 16, But at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in there, thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even. Well, boy, there's that word even again. I wonder if we can define that word. What is even? Is that, is that like evening? Oh, next word. At the going down of the sun. Imagine him saying that real slow to you so that you catch it. That's the Passover. Yep, that's exactly the way I see it, too. Uh, no, uh-oh, here's a question you might have to be asked. Does Passover always happen during the first month? That's a fair question. Let's see. Maybe there's a hole in this theory we have. Second Chronicles chapter 30. Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the... Uh-oh. Second month. Wow. Let's see. Boy, I don't know how we're going to get out of this mess. Now, Second Chronicles 30. This was going to go, this was going to happen about 765 years after that first Passover. Something may have gone wrong between then and this period. Well, now, let's look at that calendar again. You know the Passover is going to start coming up around the 14th. Let's say on the 12th, a couple of days before, you, let's say you start to have a cold sore, maybe around your mouth or lip or whatever. And maybe people that see you with that, maybe they get very concerned. And they think you might have some form of leprosy. Now, the custom back then would, would be to lock you away, lock you up for about seven days, and then check you at the end of that seven days to see if it's gotten worse, or was it just a sore? You know, they wanted to be very careful. Well, if that should happen, well, if that should happen to you, you don't know what's going to happen. It's unforeseen. You missed Passover. If only there was some way that God would provide for you so that you could participate in Passover. And guess what? There was. Numbers chapter 9, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean, by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord the fourteenth day of the second month at even. They shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Well, there you have it. God wanted to give people a second chance. Okay? They were living with the law. The law kind of seems a little rigid to them. God says, I understand these things. I'm going to give you an opportunity 
to go ahead and, and have Passover and observe it. Now, we in America would probably think, oh, I got sick and I missed it. I'll just do it, you know, maybe the next weekend or, or uh, let's see, a week from the 14th. That would be the 21st. I'll just do it then. Well, no, no. God has a formula here. He, he really likes that 14th day. For whatever reason, he, he's got his own reasons. We're not going to question him. So he has made this formula. If you miss it this time, well, look forward to the next month and then do it then. Now back to that Second Chronicles verse. The people of Second Chronicles, they found out that they were totally in the wrong. And they wanted to get right with God, but they were a few days late to celebrate the Passover. So they used their Bible as their final authority and got right with God on the second month, which God allowed. Now that was about oh, 700 and some years after the first Passover. I wonder if the Bible mentions a Passover after this one. Why, here's one in Ezra chapter 6. And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month. And this would be about 900 years after the first Passover. They are still doing it the way God instructed them to do it. So they're they're back on track, so to speak. Now they mess up in other areas, but for the most part, for observing Passover, they're, they've, they're back on the calendar. Now I'm going to go back to Acts chapter 12 and concentrate on verse 3. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. The arrest of Peter took place after Passover. Now, since it took place after Passover, then how could King Herod hold him until the Passover to kill him? Well, the answer is he couldn't. Unless you want to make the crazy argument that he's going to hold him for a whole year. You know, because he would have to hold him for a year if he's going to wait for the Passover. The Passover just happened a few days ago. I hope I've explained this. Now, for some people, this explanation is not good enough. They will continue to argue and give it one more shot. In fact, I'll even show you where they give it yet another shot after that. They'll argue and say whether I'm right or not doesn't make any difference because in the Greek it says Pascha, and that word means Passover. And they'll say that the Greek language would call for a different word for Easter, an entirely different word. Now, if they ever tell you that, you ask them, then what Greek word do they use for Easter? <laughs> and this is the crowd. <laughs> they're, they're usually in an all-fired hurry to tell us what Greek words mean anyway, so this should be right up their alley, but they will probably resist and not even tell you. So let's, let's find out for ourselves. I wonder what the Greek people, the Greeks, living in the country of Greece, I wonder what word they use when they say, hey, you know, it's the month of March. I wonder when Easter's coming. That's not an uncommon question. We ask that all the time over here in America. You know, Easter could, Easter's all over the place. It can be in March or, or as late as April 25th. Who knows when it's going to be? They have a formula to figure that all out. Well, I happen to have a Greek friend. I asked him. I said, Nicholas, that's his name, by the way. Nicholas, what, what word do you guys use when you say Easter? Now, Nicholas is not a Bible-thumping Christian like I am. He had no idea the context of why I'm even bothering to ask him. I asked him in the month of May. You know, the last thing on his mind. He said, Easter? Oh, yeah, that's Pascha. Pascha. My Bible is correct. But they're going to take another shot at it. And here it is. Here's their ace in the hole from Luke 22. They hope that this is going to be a rock 
that flies through the air and strikes us because we're the, you know, mean old Goliath to them. And this is going to stagger us and they're going to swoop in and give us the death, the death blow or whatever. But no, but here it is. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Wow. That, that's their verse. Well, I'll save this for it. It's slightly vague. I'll give them that. Sure. Do you really think that this one little verse is going to refute all of the verses I've just shown you? Do you think for one minute that Luke himself doesn't even know what Passover is? My final authority is Jesus. This is how I shrug off that. And he said, Go into the city to such a man and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my time disciples now does Jesus keep his word I would say yes didn't Jesus get arrested a few hours later yes did the disciples join him in being arrested did they all get lined up have their own cross were all the disciples put in the grave for a few days with Jesus? No. If the Passover were an eight-day event, then Jesus didn't keep his word to spend it with his disciples. So here's what happened. Herod the king arrested Peter during the Days of Unleavened Bread. He intended after the pagan festival of Easter to bring him forth to the people and eventually to kill him, of course. This all works just fine and dandy. Easter can come as late as April 25th. Somewhere during between the 15th and the 21st is when Peter is arrested. And then in just a few days, a few short days, Easter would be here and over. And then King Herod would turn his attention to Peter. He's already got him locked up. He thinks Peter's going to stay in there. Of course, God has other plans and gets Peter out of there. A, uh, oh, a modern day equivalent of this would be if you get arrested on December 28th, you know, a few days after Christmas. Well, they may hold you until after New Year's before they, you know, do much with you or you see the judge. Or I don't know all the legalities of that, but that's the uh, nearest modern-day equivalent I can give you. It fits. He's talking about the pagan festival Easter, okay? He's not talking about Passover. Passover already happened on the 14th. That was a few days ago. So if you happen to have one of these versions of the Bible, Tyndale's New Testament, the Miles Coverdale Bible, or the King James, you've got the correct word in your Bible. They correctly translate the Greek word Pascha 28 times as Passover, and they correctly translate the Greek word Pascha as Easter one time. Tyndale himself is the one that came up with the word Passover. It's a, it's a fantastic word. It describes the event perfectly. And when he got to that verse in the book of Acts, he realized, wait a minute, this one, this time it won't fit this way. And so he was wise enough to choose Easter. That's the one that fits. All right, now let's get into those pesky, archaic words. You know, the typical complaint we often hear is, well, that old Bible, it's just too hard to understand, it's too difficult. Well, but let's take a look and see just how difficult it supposedly is. Here's a verse in Esther, and we're going to concentrate on that word evil. I'm going to underline it there for you. Now, many people might think that that word is old-fashioned and archaic. Uh, so, from the Alexandrian texts, 
uh, comes the English Standard Version. Now, not necessarily because it's an Alexandrian text is the problem here. The problem is they have consulted many dictionaries or lexicons or what have you, and they've had to change many of these words, otherwise they won't be able to have a copyright to prove that it's different. So they're going to take the word evil in the English Standard Version, and they're going to change that to calamity. Now, I would argue that evil is much easier to understand. Go ask a kindergartner uh, what evil is. Most of them know. Most of them are probably very capable of practicing this uh, at a young, mischievous age. Then ask them what calamity means. And I think you're going to have... Uh, some difficulty on their part to tell you a good answer. Uh, the New International says disaster. But again, which word is easier to understand at a young grade level? I, I would think evil is. I don't think many of the words they claim are archaic really are. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, we have the word evil. You'll notice that I've gone ahead and underlined the whole sentence, or the whole last part of the phrase, that uh, mentions evil. That's going to be gone in the English Standard Version. They don't even want to attempt to translate the last, that last part. It's just gone. So you don't have to worry about that old archaic word evil. It's also gone in the New International Version. It's just not there. Now, right off the bat, I'm going to make somebody mad because I dare to be talking about the English Standard Version. And don't, don't I know that that's an upcoming popular translation? Yeah, yeah, I kind of do. But uh, I don't have any real respect for it. I think it's pretty lousy, and I'm being generous. I mean, would you think this is the whole words of God? First Samuel chapter 13 verse 1 <laughs> and I've heard some people say oh I just love the way this one reads well <laughs> since you like reading it so much why don't you read to me this verse you can't really can you imagine little boys and girls learning this as a memory verse hey mom I, I, I know a memory verse oh really what is it well Saul was blank 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 years old but I tell you what, I don't want to misquote you guys. You tell me, should I say dash, 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 or should I say blank, blank, blank? I would hate to have you think that I am misquoting you. But I tell you what, to make you happy, I'll stop picking on the ESV. After all, I believe it speaks for itself here. Even in areas where it's painfully obvious that it doesn't speak at all. Yes, boys and girls, it's much easier now. <laughs> Very easy. Go ahead and learn that as a memory verse. It's, this is totally ridiculous. I, I won't even mess with them anymore. Acts chapter 19, verse 9. Now, the word evil is showing up right there. I'm going to underline it. And what's the New International say about that? Maligned. Maligned. Now, maligned, <laughs> yeah, you look it up in the dictionary, it mentions evil. Which word is easier to understand? Ask a kindergartner. Hey, little Billy, what's maligned mean? Well, I don't know. All right, well, then what's evil mean? Well, most of them know. You don't need to be a child scholar to know what evil means, okay? But on some of these newer translations, you have to be a pretty good scholar to know what these other words mean. Now, let's switch it up a little bit. Usually I'm giving you the good old King James first, and then I'm giving you what they've done to it. Now we're going to play the other way around. I'm going to give you what the Thomas Nelson publishers want you to have. They want you to have the Catholic-friendly New King James Version with their fancy logo. Uh, then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth tree. Wow, terebinth tree. I guess terebinth is a word that must have replaced some old archaic word that we would no longer use anymore. So what, what word did that replace? It replaced planes. 
Okay, well, after all, maybe these guys at Thomas Milson, maybe they know what they're doing. You know, they're professionals. Won't question them. Here we have that showing up again in Genesis 35. It's Terebinth tree. Oh, Terebinth tree. Okay. Well, is it going to be plains again? No, it's oak. They replaced that very hard, hard to understand, archaic word, oak. Now, uh, I would think the word oak is much easier, but once again, don't question these guys. They know what they're doing. Here we have Terebinth showing up again in Hosea chapter 4. So is it going to replace oak? Well, maybe not, because you'll notice just a few words before Terebinth, there's the word oak. Oak, popular, and Terebinth. Well, if it's not going to replace oak, what is this fabulous word Terebinth going to replace? The very hard to understand word elms. I don't think these guys at Thomas Nelson know their trees. They're they're using this word terabith all over the place, kind of like it's a low hog. It has you know, five hundred different meanings. Oh, you're just being nitpicky. Oh, well maybe. In Titus chapter one, we have the word dissipation. Wow. Now I'm sure that everyone has heard of the word dissipation. Who could forget the terrible dissipations of the 1960s and the Watts dissipation? Ah, yes, that's right. The terrible and old-fashioned word riot has just been replaced with dissipation. Now ask yourself, which word was easier to understand? And in that same verse, insubordination replaces the word unruly. Dissipation or insubordination. How many syllables is that? Instead of riot, unruly. Which one of these is really easier to understand? I'm going to say that old-fashioned one. I know. I wouldn't have believed it either until I saw it. First Kings chapter 1. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue and all this other stuff. Retinue. Retinue. What is a retinue? Hey, little Billy, little Mary, out of kindergarten class, what's retinue? Do they know? What old-fashioned archaic word did retinue replace? Train. Okay, she came to Jerusalem with all this stuff, followed behind her, you know, like a caravan, a whole train of it. Not a choo-choo train, but just a train of following, of followers. Like the train from your wedding gown, okay? A retinue. Wow, do you have to be a scholar to understand these new words? I'm, I'm afraid you do. Night creature. Oh, let's read this first. The wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the jackals, and the wild goat shall bleat to its companion. Also the night creature shall rest. Ooh, what is this? Is this a boogeyman? The night creature. Ooh. Wow. What did they replace? A screech owl. I know. I, I can't believe it either. It, I, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Satraps. Wow, what in the world is a satrap? I'm sure everybody's heard of one, right? You mean you haven't heard of the word satrap? Why, they've got one of these running around in England. You've heard of uh, Satrap Charles. Yep. Prince. Prince Charles. Or if it's plural, princes. But which of these is easier to understand? Is my old-fashioned Bible that you don't like, is it easier to understand than satraps? Well, I know the answer to that. Oh, and by the way, don't, don't be too hard on them with the word satraps. They're just trying to agree wholeheartedly with their good old friends, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the New World Translation. Okay? 
I mean, sure, they uh, they translate John chapter 1, verse 1, just a tad different. But other than that, they're pretty much a Jehovah's Witness Bible. I- I'm sorry. Somebody had to say it. Genesis 9, 9, descendants. How many syllables is that? That replaces seed, a one-syllable word, which is harder. Now, Ruth, chapter 4, verse 5, we have perpetuate perpetuate apparently young boys and girls couldn't handle the phrase raise up but they can apparently understand perpetuate now if I told you early on that one of these was going to be easier to understand which one would you have thought was going to be easier well it's my old fashioned one Oh, they should run aground on these Certus Sands. Wow, does this sound like an archaic word? Do you Certus Sand? What is a Certus Sand? Oh, it's quicksand. Yeah. It replaced that old archaic word quicksand. Uh, distressing replaces evil. I could do a bunch of these. I'm not going to. I, I think a few of these just speak for itself. I don't need to exhaust myself or you. Here's the Flesh Kincaid grade level indicator. You'll have, uh, by the way, KJV, that stands for King James Version. Uh, then next in the uh, second column is NIV. Then there's the New American Standard. Then the TEV, that stands for Today's English Version, otherwise known in America as the Good News Bible, formerly known as the Good News for Modern Man. Big, long phrase. And finally, the Thomas Nelson Catholic-friendly New King James. Now, you have a grade level here. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, you have Malachi chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, and Revelation chapter 1. Now, in all these, on occasion, you may have a newer translation that will, you know, just barely be a little bit easier. But on the whole, that old-fashioned King James Bible is easier to read for grade levels. Now, if I'd have shown you this chart at the very first thing we started talking about, you wouldn't have believed me. You wouldn't have believed me, but it's true. Now you have a better chance of believing me because I've shown you a few examples of just how rough these translations can be. Because they've gone to a dictionary, they can't use these simple words, so they have to use another word that kind of means the same thing. Well, you can do that because our language is very broad, but uh, you're making it harder. And all the time you're making these new versions, you're claiming that it's easier to understand. Now, finally, after all these years, we can understand God's word. Baloney. I don't agree with you. No wonder in our Bible we have this verse, 2 Corinthians 3.12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Well, I would agree with them. I wonder what a newer translation might say to that. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. I'll say you do. You're pretty bold at many of the things you do with God's word. What do these Southern Baptist Holman Christian Standard Version? Notice I'm using these little copyright symbols by them because they are copyrighted. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness. Boldness in what? Well, doesn't matter. We're just bold. Okay. Now you might say, well, yeah, okay. You may have a point there, but that, your old Bible, it's pretty hard to understand. You You got thee and thou and ye and... Oh, my goodness. Isn't it much easier just to have the word you in our new translations? I mean, after all, that's the new modern English. They've replaced these words. All these words mean you. We just go ahead and write the word you. Well, but when you do that, you kind of lose something here. I'll explain. Anytime you see the letter T in a word like thee, thine, or thou, or thy, and stuff like that, that is speaking to one person. Okay. Anytime you see the letter Y in a word like ye, you, or your, well, then it's speaking to everyone. And you say, what's the big deal? All right, if I go into a classroom and I'm looking at somebody and I say, you come with me, well, chances are everyone knows I'm talking to one person. But what if I'm talking to the entire class? You come with me. 
Well, they may not know that. Because our word you has kind of left out some of this division between singular or speaking to everyone. And the really good example of that is when Nicodemus comes to see Jesus. Uh, we find about, out about that in John chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. Well, he uses two versions of the word you in that verse alone. There's a good reason why he does that. He's talking directly to Nicodemus. And that's why he says thee. However, he then changes the word to ye, meaning everybody. Because in our modern day equivalent, marvel not that I say it unto you, you must be born again. You might be able to make the argument, it would be a terrible argument, but you might be able to make the argument that Jesus is only talking to Nicodemus. Well, he's not. Now, he's talking to Nicodemus, but when he says, ye must be born again, he means everybody. So this helps you not to get into a trap of trying to say, well, maybe Jesus is talking only to Nicodemus, and that's good for Nicodemus. That's how Nicodemus must get to heaven. But maybe there's a different way for me, because after all, he's just talking to Nicodemus. He's talking to Nicodemus, all right, but he's also talking to all of us at the same time. And that's the great thing about the written English word. You can be specific and not give anybody any wiggle room. And that's why I prefer it. I think in our modern language, we've lost that. I think it would be great if we started using thee and ye again. I think it would be, we would have more clarity. Now, you know, I don't think that's going to happen, but I think it would be superior to what we already have now. So you might ask, are there any examples of God using an archaic or outdated word on purpose? Well, yeah. We find that in 1 Samuel chapter 9. Now, I've got pictures of a couple of donkeys there. Uh, it's a story about a guy looking for some donkeys. Now, they're going to call it something else. So you'll excuse me if I read this. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. And so, of course, Saul and the servant passed through this place, and they passed through that place, and passed over here and over there. And I'm not going to read all the places to you. But they did not find the donkeys. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, let us return. He wants to go back home, and he's kind of worried. Verse 6, the servant is now talking to him, says, Behold now, there is in the city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. And maybe we can ask him what to do about the, you know, our missing donkeys. Verse 7, Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? He wants to give him a gift, you know, in, in exchange for doing this nice favor by maybe, you know, telling him, giving him advice or, you know, inquiring of God where to go find these donkeys. Verse 8, and the servant answered Saul again, said, Behold, I have here, you know, a little bit of money to pay him. Now, verse 9 is the important one. Verse 9 is in parentheses, okay? Now, are there parentheses in the originals? No, but... They recognized early on, this is a side note from God. Okay, God is getting ready to explain something to us. And it's like he, he puts this in the middle of a, of a narrative. It's a note to us. I'm going to write this out, otherwise you guys might miss it. Okay, so let me explain what I'm about to do. Okay, it's really great of him to do that. So here's the note to us. Before time, in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spoke. Spake, come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Now, seer equals prophet. God didn't even have to bother telling us that. 
By the time the book of 1 Samuel gets written, the word seer had fallen out of use. Nobody's going around saying seer anymore. If he wanted to, he could have used the word prophet, and no one would have noticed. Yet God chose to quote the servant of Saul instead of giving us an updated edition or modern translation of what the servant said. For whatever reason, God thought it was important to quote the servant of Saul verbatim. Either that, or God really likes to use this old word seer. Now, I don't understand why. Once again, when it happened, when Saul and his servant were out looking for the donkeys, that word was in use. But by the time it gets recorded for us in the book of 1 Samuel, it's no longer in use. No one would have probably noticed had God just translated it prophet and let's just move on and not bore everybody with some trivia detail but that's not what happens so they go on in verse 11 he's going to use the word seer and they're going to use that word seer in a lot of places now let's skip ahead years later in first chronicles 29 now the Acts of David the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer, and in the book of Nathan, the prophet, and in the book of Gad, the seer. By this time, and this is probably a few hundred years later, they're using the word seer and prophet interchangeably. What happened? God introduced a word. He brought a word back into practice or vogue. And now it's part of their vocabulary. See, when God comes down to our level, you got to realize he's got a very large vocabulary. He can't use it all with us. We don't know his vocabulary. So he's going to kind of lower what he says to us to get it kind of onto our level. Uh, but wouldn't it be great if every now and then he could teach us something and have us rise up and start using a, a higher vocabulary like he does? If, uh, now, this is, not, this is not the only occasion where this is used. Years later after that, in the book of Amos, we find it. Seer. He introduced an old word, and it became used. So he dusted off an old word and used it, and it became part of the language from then on. Now people use this word. It was an old and forgotten one. So when your pastor comes across an archaic word that he reads in the Bible, and he could feel free to give the congregation a definition of that word. But we need to leave it in the text. Okay, it may come back into vogue later on. You don't just scratch out a word going, well, we don't use this one anymore. No, you go ahead and make a little note off to the side, this is what that word means. And then congratulations, you've added a word to your vocabulary. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. But if you're saying, you know, I still feel that I'm going to need some help with that text. I've been so used to reading these other versions. Well, I think the biggest problem you're going to have with the uh, the old King James is the names of these guys, okay? They laugh at our names, like Chuck and Donald. They think, well, that's, you know, ridiculous. To us, those are normal names. When you get some of these guys like Sherebeth and stuff like that, well... We're not used to saying names like that, so it seems kind of funny. But if you still need some help, I do have a small recommendation for you. You don't have to do it, I, but I have discovered that there is something out there called the Defined King James Bible, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a sample page. Um, notice some of the words are in bold print, uh, and they have a number above them. Well, let's select one here on the left here, Publicans. And you'll notice that it has a number five. So you go down to the bottom of the footnotes. It says, Tax Collectors for the Roman Empire. Now, they didn't scratch out the word publican. They didn't insert the definition into the text, pretending that it's part of the Word of God. They just defined it at the bottom. They've left the text alone. The text is important. Okay? So if, you know, some of these words I don't think you really need help with, uh, justified, 
the word somewhat. I think a lot of these are pretty easy to figure out, and of course I'm used to reading it. So, but if you if you think a good definition like this at the bottom would help you, well then, feel free to get you one of these. Uh, here's their address, thebibleforToday.org, and I won't spend many more time on that commercial. But uh, I want to encourage you: read your old Bible. It's good. In my opinion, it's still the best. Uh, that's all.